Was Meister Eckhart Christian? No. At least not if we're talking about your average layperson and we insist upon certain elements belonging to Christianity and it's just not Christian if we don't have those elements. In other words, the way that your average person defines Christianity, so if you walk up to your you know, average person on the street and ask them, you know, do you have to have the historical Christ being significant, uh, you know, God become flesh for Christianity? Do you have to have you know, certain kinds of prayer where you can talk to God and you can ask him things? Do you have to have um, a certain notion of faith? Then, you know, is it something where that's an absolutely essential part of Christianity? So historical Christ, faith, prayer. Do you have to have fasting? Do you have to have chastity? Do you have to have hell? Do you have to have heaven? Do you have to have an afterlife for the individual soul with its full personality? Any of those elements, if any of those elements are necessary, it's not clear that Meister Eckhart was Christian. And the answer to this involves esotericism and spiritual progression, which is a little strange, but follow me here for a moment and I'll show you. So if those elements are necessarily a part of Christianity, then we don't get them in Eckhart. So the historical Christ, well, the historical Christ, it's not as though Eckhart doubted that. It's just that it was a tool. It was something that, you know, might be good for people. If it works for you, that's great. He uses it uh, in some ways very quickly to go beyond it in his, his sermons, but it's not a point of emphasis for him at all. And it seems as though if that part were removed, then we wouldn't lose anything about Eckhart's message. And indeed, that's true because Eckhart's message is fundamentally mysticism. And mysticism doesn't need any particular element of dogma. And this is really the difference. This is what this comes down to. If there are dogmatic elements of Christianity that are necessary for Christianity, then Eckhart was not a Christian by that standard. Now, that creates a very weird sort of situation. And this is partially because I think now people have, you know, taken on the idea with especially post-Reformation in Protestant Christianity that it's open to everyone. There is a priesthood of believers. They're saved by faith alone. And that's open to available to absolutely everyone, including not only people of, you know, average intelligence and no education or something of the kind, but even children. In other words, the religion itself, from children all the way to the most learned of scholars, has to be kind of leveled. And if that's the case, that the whole thing has to be leveled, then we're no longer in an Eckhartian Christianity. We're no longer in something that requires spiritual experience. In other words, if spiritual experience doesn't teach you something, it doesn't help you to see something, to raise you to a level of understanding and seeing and being that you were not at previously, then you're left with the religion of effectively a child. You're, re you're left with what Houston, uh, Houston Smith called a childish sentimentality in the sense that it's something alongside, you know, Santa Claus and Batman and the others. If you have a religion that insists upon your undying and unquestioning belief to Batman, people are going to turn away. They're not going to go towards that kind of thing. And maybe even rightly so, that it's not the kind of thing that people find believable today. And so that element, that particular kind, that conception of Christianity itself is noticeably and really pretty obviously dying. That's the kind of thing that is not going to survive unto the next age with people changing in the modern world as they are now, moving away from Christianity, moving toward other elements that are just not compatible with, you know, a physical hell, a physical heaven, the historical Christ, the physical resurrection, the, you know, unquestioning belief and, you know, what is given to you by authority, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of these things uh, people find to be largely unbelievable. It doesn't work for them now. And so they're turning away and they're going elsewhere. And so if that's your version of Christianity, then Eckhart is not going to be in your group. On the other hand, Eckhart was declared to be an Orthodox theologian. This is 1992 by Pope John Paul II. And so esotericism has actually always been in Catholicism. It's always been in Christianity. But Christianity has a kind of uneasy relationship with esotericism. The idea that some people must be, you know, more spiritually accomplished by what it is that they've seen. That's a strange thing that sits kind of oddly with people who are otherwise very, very serious 
about certain kinds of prohibitions and certain kinds of rules that this is right, this is wrong, and I'm not listening to anything else. I'm thinking in particular here of Thomas Aquinas' famous declaration toward the end of his life that compared to what he has seen, everything else is but straw. So it's all but chaff. It's all just waste. You know, everything that he's written, which was a lot, it's like an entire bookshelf. It's crazy. Over his entire life, he said towards the end, something that he saw, something that he experienced, presumably a mystical experience that made the whole thing, you know, it's as if he didn't write a word. None of those words mean anything compared to that experience. They don't touch it. They don't come to it. They don't approach it. It's not as though you've got a few of the beliefs right and you're most of the way there. No, there's no relationship whatsoever between the experience of God and all of the beliefs and practices and rites and rituals and scripture and writings and everything else. All of those things are secondary to the experience of God. And in fact, this is the kind of thing that, I mean, this is to some extent a commonplace, but not really. People don't oftentimes like fully admit what the significance of this is. And one of the passages that I particularly like is from Cyprian Smith, who wrote on Eckhart. He's one of my favorites on, on Eckhart. And he was a Benedictine monk. And he wrote about this and saying that not only the institutional church, but every everything in Christianity, all of its trappings are not God. The church is not God. The idea of Christ is not God. The idea of, you know, the, what we get in scripture is not God. These are things on the way to God. They are paths. They are things that hopefully help you to get there. But that makes them tools. That makes them of instrumental use rather than being the final destination themselves. And that's a crucial distinction. And so in that way, and I want to introduce this again, kind of ironically, I'm smiling because yeah, distinction is a pun and you'll see. <laughs> Eckhart is famous for saying that God is distinct in his indistinction, in the sense that God is divine oneness for Meister Eckhart. So a background of divine unity, complete and utter divine oneness of God being being of all kinds, where God is everywhere in everything, not some sort of supernatural old man in a toga sitting up on a mountain that you've never seen or heard from, but you just have to trust me, right? That's not the kind of thing that we get in Meister Eckhart or in general with the mystics. What we get instead is something more like John Scotus Origina, where God is everywhere, in everything, in the smallest little bit of reality, no matter how insignificant it might seem, the whole of divinity is within it, just as if by, you know, extra dimensions or something like that, right? I mean, you, whatever your imagination might draw you to. And they were not shy about mathematical metaphors, Nicholas of Cusa especially, but also Meister Eckhart. Nevertheless, so God is indistinct in his, uh, is God is distinct in his indistinction. And so divine oneness then cannot have anything in common with dogma. Can't have anything in common with any institution, any dogma, or any kind of practice, rite, ritual, scripture, or anything else. They all have to be tools to get you there because they are all in the world of multiplicity. In other words, there is scripture and there is not scripture. There is a label like God and there is not God. There is Christ, there is not Christ. There is fasting and not fasting, chastity and not chastity. There are all the, if, if it's possible to negate any of these things, then you're not there. That you're not at divine oneness. You're not at this conception of God, which has been not just with Meister Eckhart, but by the way, all of the Christian mystics going back for 2000 years. So this is a tradition of esotericism within Christianity that is really very interesting, but is not, as Houston Smith said, childlike or childish sentimentality. It's not Batman. This is not God as Batman. This, this is God as mystical oneness. This is God as a oneness that uh, underwrites everything, underlays everything. It is behind everything. It is what happens if you take away all distinctions. If you drop all distinctions of you and me, of I and thou, that one has an interesting history. And everything conceivable every conceivable definition, every conceivable distinction, then you arrive at divine oneness, just as if you take a wax tablet that already has letters on it and you get rid of the letters. If you take a drink that is dirty and you clear, uh, you clear out, clean out the glass, that prepares you then to receive and gives you what Meister Eckhart called capax dei, which is the capacity to receive God, which for him, of course, the capacity for, to receive was also the capacity to conceive. Because then in divine oneness, obviously it's not you and God, again, I am now, right? No, it's just divine oneness of which you are a part, of which you are a co-worker, meaning in eternity, 
forever giving birth to the word. In other words, Christ or whatever it is. It doesn't have to be Christian, but it can be. And that's the point here is that if your version of Christianity insists upon anything in distinction, insists upon anything in the realm of multiplicity, such as you have to be chaste, you have to be, you know, following this kind of ritual, you can't eat during these times, you have to do such and such, you know, um, you have to believe in this, it's, this is the creed, we all have to, you know, whatever it is. All of those things, if they're not just seen as instruments, if they're not just seen as tools, then it's not Christian esotericism, it's not esotericism, it's not mysticism in general. Now, the irony here is that for Meister Eckhart and for the other mystics, labels like Christian and not Christian, I mean, it's still a distinction. So ultimately, I don't think he would have been too concerned about it, which is why you never really hear him talk about it. And so that's kind of funny. But that helps us to really more thoroughly answer the question, was Eckhart Christian? Well, insofar as there's Christian and not Christian, no. <laughs> because Eckhart was concerned with divine oneness. It's as if to say, okay, well, if you're still asking that question, you're not there yet. So let's go exploring. And that seems to have been uh, Meister Eckhart's approach. And in general, that's the kind of thing, arguably, that is useful for people today, is not to have to worry about all those distinctions, especially all of those dogmatic distinctions, because that's precisely the kind of thing that turns people away from Christianity and from uh, institutionalized, organized religion today. So I hope this was useful. There are echoes of Emile Sirhain in here. And if you've seen my um, talk on Eckhart and faith, then you'll, you'll recognize that. So um, echoes of that, and you'll have to find out there why it is that I don't go all the way with Sirhain. But nevertheless, I hope it was useful. I hope it was good to think with.